So let's jump into the Old Testament book of Joshua today. I'm looking forward to, to digging in. Honestly, this particular book of history has always been fascinating to me. For one, it, it opens up a, a personality, a leader that, that's worthy of, of emulating, of following. Um, people throughout history have, have followed Joshua, whether they followed him as a servant leader and seen that example, whether they followed him as a military leader and seen some amazing victories and how it all unfolded and the strategies and various things around it. So there's a lot, of, a lot of history, a lot of personality. But as we go through it, let's not let it become something that happened back then. May it be something that can take place even now. Because you're going to see principles. You're going to see things that, that, are, uh, that have application in our lives today. And I believe as we grow in our relationship with God, as he teaches us his ways, then as we take hold of these truths, then we do experience his touch in the knowledge of his presence. Now, beginning in verse 1, I'd like to read it to verse 9. And, and we're going to go through the Bible the way we receive the Bible, in a sense of chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So I'll go through these first nine verses today. On Wednesday, on our step-by-step, I'll pick up from where we leave off on Sunday. I'll carry through, and then the following week, we'll in all probability pick up where we left off on Wednesday. Now, if you can't make Wednesday night and be with us, we will have the audio online. You just want to, again, go to our website and work your way through to sermons and to the message, and you can track with us as we go through this particular book. Beginning in verse 1 of Joshua 1, we read, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... It came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, And to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. All right. Let's move right back to verse 1 and work our way through this, walk our way through. Joshua was not called because of seniority, but because of submission. It's important that we realize that. Seniority, you know what I mean? The, he, he's the, been there the longest, so he obviously needs to be the next one to, to take the lead. And to understand it, we're going to consider a little bit about Moses. Moses was the one that Joshua served as an assistant to Moses. Moses could have been described many different ways. He had many different titles. Um, He was a great patriarch, a great leader. But Moses, according to the scripture, the description is that Moses was a servant of the Lord. So important. See, a servant, the highest position in Israel at that time, the highest position among this nation that is being delivered from captivity in Egypt is called a servant, a servant of the Lord. See, you know, Moses served God. He was a minister of God. Minister just means to serve. It it came to mean in our culture somewhat of a vocational title, but the truth of the the, the word, it, it just means servant, And so here, Moses was this model. He sought the Lord, he heard from the Lord, and he obeyed the Lord. Moses was submitted to God. Now, I will admit, he had some pretty phenomenal experiences, agreed. You know, I mean, like 
you know, a bush lighting up and talking to him, stuff like that, which would get your attention a little bit. But prior to that, he had already submitted to the Lord. He'd already been seeking the Lord. And, and that was kind of a confirmation. He had some great experiences. And I would suggest to you, the experiences were of greater magnitude when the submission was there to begin with. In other words, he had already put himself where, where he could see and, and know the hand of God. Moses was submitted to God. It's interesting because as he's submitted to God, as he's serving God, he is in connection, so to speak. He's, he's seeking, as I said, he sought the Lord, he heard from the Lord, and he obeyed the Lord. It is possible, it's actually not uncommon, you can offer service to God and not be submitted to God. Does that make sense? You can just do things because they're observable. You observed them and it seemed like a good thing. So you, you participated to some measure from an external sense and not really submit. Israel did this. Israel did this frequently in, in their offerings and in their, quote, obedience. They just did it because they're supposed to. And, and God actually called them out on it because they offered sacrifices many times without submitting to him. It continued clear through generation after generation. There's always been an element of that. Even in, in when Jesus was teaching, you know, early, really fairly early in his in his public ministry, we would call it he, in Matthew chapter seven, as he's finishing this very lengthy message, very specific and detailed message, he's talking to those who had gathered around him and were curious, and he said, you know. Many will say, look what I have done for you. I did this, and I helped with that. I supported them, and I gave to that. Jesus' own words to some of those people, I never knew you. I never knew you. It's actually what a songwriter I'd heard 30 years ago described this very well. He called it the most terrifying words to man. A person who says, oh yeah, I'm Christian. Oh yeah, it relates to the Christian subculture. Does things because that's what's observable, but has no relationship with Christ. He just does it. Jesus said, I, I never knew you. And then he says this, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Wow, that's gut-wrenching, quite honestly. If we think, man, who's he talking to? Could it be me? You know, that's a good introspect. It's a good consideration. Like, man, am I just doing things because I've observed, I've learned, I've had mentors in my life, I've had people around me that have done these things, and I'm just keeping the ball rolling? I, I, it's very good to check that. You know what they say? Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Seriously? It's like, wow. And that shouldn't, shouldn't stir any fear that should say, well, thank you, a cause, a response. Like, God, thank you for salvation. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, God, that you want me to know you. You, you want me to walk according to your truth. You, God, uh, you will protect me from religion. You'll protect me from appeasing people with my outward expression. You actually would speak to, to me, to you. Isn't it phenomenal? It, it's actually one of our difficulties to realize that the God of creation will speak to you personally, dwell within you, take up residence, cause you to be born again, born of the Spirit, and guide your steps. And we're told that you know, Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, that person of the triunity of God would indwell you, and, that, and the Holy Spirit is a helper. He describes what he would do in your life. He would help you. He's a comforter, which means he would... Comfort you. He would guide you in all truth, we're told. That's what he says. And so that's his desire. And we say, I don't know the Bible that well. I don't, I'm not into this church stuff. I don't understand this religion junk. I see a bunch of hypocrites. Well, we'll stop just a minute. All that may be true. But, you know, he would say to you and me, listen, I want to, I want to teach you. I, I want you to know me. Not just know practices, know me. So I want to encourage you, make sure your service is because you are surrendered and submitted to Jesus. 
And that can't be done in a public setting. That can only be done in the privacy of your own heart between you and Jesus. In your conversation, in your engagement, and however it may be. Some people have beautiful prayer closets. And they have, they have great personal time with Jesus in that private space. Some of us go public. And what I mean by that is I use public space. Preferably away from a lot of people. Preferably in an isolated place. Preferably where I have a beautiful view. And I find myself many times, that's where it's just between me and Jesus. And it's like, okay, Lord, what are you showing me? What are you teaching me? I want to make sure that it's because I'm surrendered. Submitted to the Lord. You know, I've used those words somewhat interchangeably. But there, there's a distinction between surrendered and submitted. When you surrender, you quit fighting, right? It's kind of the concept, you know. You've surrendered, you, you quit fighting. <clears throat> I surrendered to my older brother when I was about 12. The reason I surrendered, I wasn't submitted to him. I surrendered because he had me down. My arms were in this position on the dirt, and he was practicing his boxing on my face. And so you can't, when you're on the ground looking up, you, you just don't have that range of motion that you need. So, you know, he was a year older than me, still is a year older than me. And so, you know, that's just, as young, that's just how we engage as brothers. It was, it, those of you who have girls, you don't know what I'm talking about. But with boys, it was vicious. And he's just like, I can't remember what I was supposed to say, but after a couple of hits and a couple of misses, I realized this isn't working out good for me. I surrendered. Okay, okay. And so he let me up, I hit him in the back of the head, and I took off because I was not submitted. Do you see the difference? Surrendered is when you say, okay, submitted is when you say, now you lead. And sometimes we're, we're not getting that, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're not, we're kind of here like, oh, I guess I might as well give in to God. No, trust me, that's not the true surrender. The true surrender is not to a, a, a brutal brother, but a gracious father. A father that actually is calling you to him. And you realize the goodness. And man, I am so done with my way of things. I'm so done with this. God, could you just show me? Could you lead me? Surrender to submission opens the door to blessing. Understanding really what God would have. So... Submission is when we listen and obey him. Now, I've used the reference for Moses. Joshua, we're told in this verse we looked at, was the assistant to Moses. He was a servant. He was a helper. He was one who receives instruction and carries it out as instructed. Concerned about Moses and how he could do the work that God put in Moses' hands and then handed to, to, to Joshua to assist. You, you know some of the stories, you know, where you know, Moses was on the mountain and Joshua was leading the troops and he's referencing how Moses is doing because a couple guys come alongside him, held his arms up, and that's when they were winning and Joshua was advancing. So Moses led, Joshua served under him. Now, he didn't serve by seniority, as I've already said. We're told that in Numbers 27, verse 18, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. You know, for Moses to lay his hand on was a sign to the congregation of the position Joshua had as an assistant. The key, though, is the Spirit was within him. That Joshua was led by the Spirit. He was submitted to God, understood Order and authority. Order and authority has been confused with superiority. Just because you're higher up the ladder doesn't mean you're superior. It just means your authority may be different. It doesn't mean you're better than somebody, which we know in our culture that's kind of strange. Joshua learned from Moses, submit to God and you will find the call of God. He submitted to God. He understood Moses' role in his life in that season. And he under, then he received the call. See, some of us may be struggling. What's my call? What's, what's God doing? What's he calling me to? And the first thing I want you to check before the Lord, privately with, with, between him and, and you, am I submitted to him? 
Am I submitted to the Lord? Because if I'm seeking the call, but I'm not submitted, then I'm actually asking for him to tell me so that I can improve his recommendation. Hey, I would like you to do this, Dan. Eh, what's it entail? That's not lordship. That's partnership, maybe. It's probably more along the lines of insubordination, actually. So it's like, okay, Lord, I just want to figure out what it means to submit to you, surrender to you, know you, and then you bring about, you develop, you show me what my calling is. And by calling, you don't mis- confuse that with vocation. Calling is what the Bible talks about, is God's invitation to you to be about what he leads you to. It's his invitation. He's leading you into something. He may be building a relationship. He may be breaking a relationship. He may be opening opportunities. He, there's just a wide range. What's he inviting me to? Well, you're not going to know if you're not submitted. You can guess. You can stumble. So, Finishing this thought about types of leadership. Servant leadership is not like the world. The world we live in, we're very familiar with it. It's... Nick's man on the ladder, step up. There's a place for that. I understand that. There's an element of experience and ability and capability and all these things that fit into the leadership structure. But servant leadership is similar, but not the same. Servant leadership is know the master and what he's calling you to. Know the order that he would bring about and know your role within that. The Bible tells us, shows us, you know, the picture of, of the church, the body of Christ, means each part has its part. And we do what we, God opens up and teaches us to do in submission to him, awareness of the overall body and how it is to be for his glory and we're functioning accordingly. Joshua did not set out to be the leader. He set out to honor God. I'm confident in that. I've studied his life multiple times. I've looked in the different portions of Scripture and tried to kind of glean from it, you know, a little bit about his character and about his approach and about his walk with the Lord. And there's nothing I've discovered that says, oh, he wanted to take over when when Moses kicked the bucket. It's not there. We see in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 an obedience. You remember that part? Their, their spies were sent out by Moses to check out the land. Go check it out. See what's going down. Just see what we're up against. So they go. And they come back. And the popular vote is crazy. No way. We can't go there. These people are beasts. They're massive. They're huge. It's like we're grasshoppers and they'll squish us. Don't do it. Ten guys agreed on that summary. Two guys seen it differently. Caleb and Joshua. They looked at it and go, if God is in it, we got no problem. If God is leading us in this and he has told us that this is where he's taken us, Therefore, it's not going to be a problem because they've seen it differently. They've seen it like, I'm going to honor God. And if God's going to lead us to this, he's going to take us through this. It's not easy to be on that side. It's easier to be popular. It's easier to cave to peer pressure. It would be easier to follow those 10 and join in with them, hoping that somehow you could influence them. That's the stupidity of common politics. Oh, let's just be with them, and so we can influence them. No, why don't you just be true? Just be true to who you are. It's easier to be you than to be someone else. That's hard enough, just being you. Just, this is how we see it. They didn't in any way undermine the other ten. They didn't in any way, you know, mock them. And not the way I see it. They just said, listen, this is all I know. I want to honor God. And if God is leading us, then that's where we're going. And that was really Joshua. We see that glimpse of his character. Now we we see that the Lord had spoken through Moses. He now speaks clearly to Joshua. A leader needs to know the word of God. A leader needs to know the word of God. Now Moses modeled that because he shared it with the people. Joshua learned from Moses the word of God. 
And now Joshua is actually hearing specifically from the Lord in regards to this new season. I can't emphasize that enough in that, what do you mean a leader? A Joshua over multitude and masses? No, a leader is somebody who has the responsibility of leading somebody. A leader may be a, a husband in a home. It may be a wife at the home taking care of the kids while the husband's outside. Uh, it, may, it may be a friend, a, a co-worker who's leading, exampling to other people. See, I, I think we'd be very careful in excluding ourselves because we're not in the position of Joshua. We, we need to realize we, we are, we do have opportunities to lead, to set example. And we need to hear from the Lord. We need to be, as we're going to see, in the Word so that we can be sure of what he's showing us. We know what he's telling us. Now, it says in verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. That wasn't breakthrough information. Joshua didn't go, what? What? Who? Oh, Mo's gone? What? No. See, they've been mourning for 30 days. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that there's a, there's a time to dance and a, and a time to cry. There's a time to, to weep and to mourn and to grieve. And God's timing is gracious and perfect. And he now prompts Joshua, Joshua, Moses is he's out. He's dead. Now, the interesting thing is they knew it, but they didn't bury him. Do you know that? Moses is a very unique person. God called him up on the mountain and blessed him because see, he didn't get to go into the, 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 the promised land because he got punky with God, honestly. He basically misrepresented God to the people and implied to the people that God was pretty ticked. And so he smacks the rock. And there's an attitude there that God says, you know what? You ain't going in. You, dis you misrepresented me. You, you, you knew better. So you know what? You're not going to get to go in either. Neither did the generation he was leading. But he did do this. He took Moses up on the top of this mountain with a view of the promised land and got, gave him a glimpse of it and allowed him to see it. He says, all right, Mo, come see me. And so Moses departed from the body to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Something took place. And the Bible says that God buried Moses and nobody knows where the plot's at. Whoa, really? Only person we're told that. And I'm thinking, hmm, interesting. I wonder why. Well, I think I could guess a couple of reasons, at least one. If you knew where he was, you would have idolized the man. If they knew where he was, they would have done like we see many other religions do. They build this, this temple and this monument, and, and they focus on this person and not on the Lord. And Moses would have them, oh, man, I did not do this. I'm gladly serving the Lord, and he delivered us. I can't part the Red Sea. I can't deal with Pharaoh's army. Moses would say, God did it. So anyway, Moses, he's on a mountain somewhere. A little sidebar. He didn't get to go into the promised land. It's kind of a bummer. But later, there's a time called the, the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember that? Where Jesus is up on a mountain, and Elijah shows up. Somebody else shows up. Moses. God snuck him in. Just give him a bonus. Grace upon grace. Grace to see the land. And centuries later, grace to stand on the land. And at some point, he will truly reign in the land with us, with those who reign and rule with Christ. So, cool little thing on Moses. But the point to this text, the thing to understand here, is that Joshua is now being prompted. It's time to go. Now, it's been 40 years since they left Egypt. 40 years. Joshua was a younger man at that time, and now it's his time. He, he's seen what happened with Moses. He understood the wanderings in the wilderness. He, it was because they wouldn't believe that they missed out on the blessing. They didn't submit to God. And now they're going to go into the land. It says, the land that I am giving them. Notice that. It's very important. In verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Go, therefore, arise, go over the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. God is not giving the land to Joshua. He's giving the land to the children of Israel, his people. 
And I have to say, sadly, historically, leadership has not realized this. Leadership in the church, in even Israel, has misunderstood and taken what God has meant for the people, they've taken it for themselves. It's just, it really is, I, I say that truthfully, it's a sad commentary on the ch- history of the church and even the history of Israel, where these palaces and places and, you know, all this stuff is built around a person and the focus on the person and they amass fortune and they amass all this stuff which was supposed to be distributed to the people. It came from the people. It was supposed to be dispersed under God's direction. But the principle here seems to get overlooked. It was not for the leader Joshua got to lead them to the promises God had for them for the children. Because servant leadership gets that. Joshua got it. He understood it. Contemporary leadership isn't always servant leadership. God is giving the land. It wasn't Joshua. Joshua didn't have anything to give. He just was an agent that the promises of God were, were performed and brought through. Joshua will be a part of the transfer of ownership, but never forget this. God is the one who provided. We're able to, as a church, help people in different situations and circumstances. And it's because, you know, people understand this concept that as God has given to us individually, we give unto the Lord for out of what he's given us. And as a church leadership, we're able to then pass that along to people, sometimes in a tough situation, and we always try, as much as we can clarify and even redundantly say, let's make sure that this isn't for me or the leadership team. The Lord has provided for you in this situation, in this season that you're in. God is the one who's taking care of you. He is the provider. Well, we see this principle, of course, in this text that God is providing. When we try to take the land for God, we often interfere with his work rather than honoring him in our work. If we try to take the land, if Joshua was, I'm going, yeah, I got it, oh, this is awesome, and away he goes, it's a mess. Realize this heart of service is a result of a relationship with God. Joshua's reminded, I told Moses this, and I'm reminding you, I will take care of you, I will lead you. I think there's some things welling up within Joshua that we'll talk about later. Um, as I said, Moses got to view the promised land. Joshua learned from Moses' mistakes, I believe. And then, you know, he decided to, okay, I'm going to do this. It's just a little bonus point if you think about it. Maybe you could make a note. Learn from somebody else's mistakes, if at all possible, because it's less painful. Seriously. I was blessed. I, as a young kid, I was introduced to a, a guy that was like 50, 60 years older than me. We shared the same birthday. He, hi- birthday. he hired me to come in and take care of his property while he vacationed in Arizona. But that man kind of took me under the wing, and he, his wing, and he started teaching me things that, you know, I didn't know as a 12, 13-year-old, 10-year-old when I started doing, taking care of his house. But Stan poured into me and shared with me his mistakes and some things that happened in his life, and, and he made it very real. Danny, don't be stupid. He just, that's, just, that's about all he said. Don't be stupid. Now, make sure you do a good job on my lawn. He always had to kind of bring it back to the job. But, no. but you see my point. Joshua learned from Moses, and it actually helped him to move forward. Then we see in verse 5, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor forsake you. I wonder at this point, so this encounter with God, I don't know how it unfolded, but he clearly heard his voice. He knew what God was saying. It's very specific. So there had to be some excitement. There had to be something, you know, welling up within him to realize for 40 years we haven't been able to go back in. And for him, it's back in. And yet now it's unfolding. Now it's, it's the moment. This is it. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, all right, this is exciting. But have you ever been there where you go from excitement and that leads to apprehension? And apprehension leads to fear and fear leads to regret? Track this process out because I, I know what happens in our lives. Oh man, this is going to be exciting. Wow, we get to, oh, I'm so looking forward to it. It's been so long. All right, here. Oh no. Wait a minute. 
We've got to gotta get that, and I've got to order this, I've got to get that, I've got to take care of this. And all of a sudden, apprehension, and then, well, but what if it doesn't work? Now fear's taking hold, like, oh, man, I don't know. Anybody who started a business, you, this is a pattern you'd have to deal with in cycle you go through. It's like, oh, man, it's like, what? And then, and then sometimes fear gets too good of a hold. Oh, man, no, no, I can't do it. No, not now. And then what happens after fear gets a hold? It slaps you in the face. See, fear sounds like wisdom. No, you shouldn't because you could lose everything. Yeah, that's a good point. And then you sit over here and fear goes, oh, stupid. Why didn't you do it? Well, you told me not to. I was afraid. See what happens in our lives? You know, fear leads to regret. I wish I would have. The window of opportunity doesn't stay open forever. And there's times we have to say, whoa, whoa, time out. And I think, you know, God's just reminding you and reminding me, as he said to, to Joshua, listen, I will be with you. I was with Moses, and he was a punk sometimes. But I never left him. I stayed there with him. I led him through. And so if that pattern's familiar, maybe we can go back to this passage. And, okay, nonetheless. It says I will not leave you nor forsake you. I, I get, you get. I don't think it's hard to figure out the leave part, right? You're with somebody, they're gone, they left, you're here. Hmm. He said, I won't do that. The forsake is a little different to process. Think of it this way. Forsake, in this context, speaks of, I will not lose you. I, I will not let go of you. I, I will not neglect you. So it's not like, you know, um, he, he just goes, wait a minute. Wasn't there, wasn't there a church in Mount Home? Wait, I'm back. Pastor Dan, maybe. I, I can't remember. Did we, did, is there something happening? You know what I mean? It's not like God's going, I forgot about the little itty bitty mountain home. This is God. Oh, bummer, I seem to have forgot them. Or it's like, you know, you're on your own now. Or like, okay, well, I'm just letting go of them. No, see, the thing to remember, aren't you glad that God holds your hand more than you hold his? See, he holds your hand. I believe I can show that clearly from Scripture. That even when I want to let go, he doesn't let go. He doesn't forsake me. He doesn't say, you know, you little punk, I'm so fed up with you and your stubbornness and your silliness and your interest in all this garbage that you won't listen to me on. Fine, go do it. See what it does to you. He doesn't do that. He says with a still small voice, come here. It's like when you're at the store with your adolescent kids and they're being punks and you go, Come here. Come here. And then you look him right in the eye like, I love you. You better listen to me. See, God never leaves us. The parent doesn't say, you know what, you little punk, hide in the clothes rack. Good luck driving home. I'm out. You know what I'm saying? You, you reach in and you just pluck him out. And then you hold a tighter grip. You don't let him go, you know, feral on you too often. So, not that... Oh, actually, we are kind of feral sometimes as Christians, but that's another sermon in and of itself. He won't leave you, neglect you. If you sense that, it's not from the Lord. If you feel that, it's not from the Lord. If you know it, it's a promise. This is the promise to know. He will not leave me, nor forsake me. He will correct me. He will chasten me because he loves me, but he's not casting me aside. There's so much security in that. There's so much comfort in that, especially those of you who have come from broken homes and you've seen the, the, the heartache with, with parents being split up and what you went through and all that stuff. It's just, this is a hard concept to embrace, but it's the truth. God does not send you aside. He does not leave you. Joshua needed to know it. You need to know it. I need to know it. Verse six, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Difficult battles require strength and courage. But you want to know where your strength lies. Remember Samson. You can look at that story. But he forgot where his strength come from. And he kind of got stuck on himself. And it says specifically he forgot where his strength comes from. Where does your strength come from? Where, what is it? What is our strength? Well, we're told later, we actually have it recorded in the New Testament, 
A letter to a person who wanted to grow, and it's preserved for all of us who want to grow. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What are we to be strong in? Grace. The knowledge of grace, unmerited favor, undeserved kindness, his blessing, not because I deserve it, but because he's good in my life. Now, I'm to be strong in that in my own knowledge because it keeps me humble before him. It was a gift brought to you, to me. And I'm to be strong in how I extend that. Joshua was to be strong in grace, and he will be. He, he will not be that overbearing leader. He will not be that tyrannical type that says, my way or the highway. Instead, he learned from Moses. Moses taught by God. Joshua taught by Moses and by God. He will now be strong in the grace. And he'll move forward and he'll involve people. and He'll delegate responsibility. And it'll, it'll be an amazing work that takes place. And it's important for us as well. Now remember, we understand, of course, you know, um, this work that he's doing is pretty powerful work. It preserved historically for a long time. It doesn't compare, though, to the promise to the work that you and I have been given. What's so important is that we realize that we're part of a great work. Joshua will, will be an active participant as God fulfills his promise to people. God's made that clear. You are going to be the one to lead my children into the land I will divide for them. He got to be an active participant as God fulfills his promises. And that's the same for you and I, even in a greater way. We have that same invite to bring you know, the promise of salvation to all people. The greatest purpose, and I mean this, this is so important. The greatest purpose in life is to know Jesus and to make him known. I, I understand occupation and relational dynamics and vocation and all the different things that are, are important in this world. But, but in view of eternity, we have to agree to be able to bring the truth of salvation to someone. You can't save them. I can't save them. But we can be an instrument that God will bring into their lives to convey truth and they get to make a decision. And that decision will affect where they spend eternity. They will either spend eternity separated from God or they'll spend eternity in the very presence of God. And we are God's agents. I think it was a bad idea, in my opinion. I think he could have done better with angels. But he decided you and I would be the, the, the messengers. You, you and I would be in the brown pants and the UPS truck and we'd just drop off a message. And we're to be almost as anonymous as that guy. So we're not about us individually, but the message we deliver. And we leave it with people, we bring it to people, we deliver it more and more. But what a wonderful thing. Because it's just, it's real. You and I will not live forever. I know you come here thinking you would, but guess what? Sorry to break your news. No, seriously. We all know we're not living forever in these bodies. This tent is coming apart. And I will depart from it someday. And I have received from other people the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God, I received that. I put my faith in that message, that truth. Because Jesus rose from the dead, because he is God. And I get to, you get to, we get to deliver that message to other people. More than just think about it, we, we, get, we need to go do it. And not just because we get to say it or put it on a piece of paper and mail it. Our lives get to reflect it. Joshua lived it out. It was his life that people learned from. It takes strength and courage to do this. Moving rather quickly. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Wait, he just said that. It's repeated, not because of redundancy, but because of importance. Be strong, very courageous. And I hope you see this. That you may observe to do. Observe to know is okay. I mean, you want to know, but that knowledge, it, it has to impact your life. It has to be consistent. It has to be reflected. Observe to do, he's told. Moving on, we see in verse 8. Well, actually, verse 7, you know, observe to do. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may be successful, that you may prosper wherever you go. Don't go left or right, not just politics, 
But literally, don't be distracted by this thing or by that thing. Keep your bearings. Yes, goals, dreams, aspirations, opportunities do vary through life. But never deviate from the foundation of truth, the foundation and the reality of who you really are. And so don't go left and right. Just stay the course. Verse 8, this book of law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Notice this again. That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You want the key? I mean, that's a great message for anybody that, if you want to grab headlines. I'm going to give you the key to success and prosperity. So here we go. The key, according to the Bible, to success and prosperity. Stay in the word. Meditate on the word. Nike up. What? What's Nike up? Just do it. Just do it. Don't make life so complicated. Just, just as a point. I, okay, I'm reading this. I'm, it makes sense. I understand this. All right, uh, I got to do it. It may involve vocabulary. It may involve anger. It may involve engagement. It, who knows? Meditate. Well, God is revealing. We, we should receive it and, and then put it into motion. Uh, look in verse 9 as we're wrapping it up. Have I not commanded you? You don't hear... The Lord speaking to Joshua, you know, Joshua, if there's anything I could suggest, here's what I'd suggest as you lead the people now. You know, Joshua, um, I would just make this one request as you lead the people. You know, Joshua, I'd recommend, do you get that from that verse? Do you get that from, have I not commanded you? See, when you're submitted to his lordship, you receive his leadership. And it is a command, and it's not a discouraging thing. It's like, okay, you know, too many times we're thinking, of, well, I'm, I think God might be suggesting something. Oh, maybe. What if he's commanding it? I'm going to give you an idea, a suggestion. I know this is what I try to do. Do it. Just do it. Okay, but I know it's going to be hard. It's going to be, yeah, yes, it is. Be strong and courageous. But observe to do, because this is a commandment from the Lord, because he knows what's best for you. He knows what's best for me. A good servant obeys the instruction of his master. Wrapping it up quickly, we have nine points from nine verses. Not verse by verse type of thing per se, but let's just consider nine points from this, these verses. I am with you. A good servant knows the word of the master. Submit to him, know him. Number two, he gives instruction and victory. He told Joshua, this is what we're going to do. Have I not said? Didn't I say before? And this is what's going to happen. Number three, we'll repeat it again. I am with you. Because we don't want to forget that. In the midst of struggles and trials and heartache and loss, we can sometimes forget that God is actually still with us. He never left us. Number four, be strong and of good courage. Number five, observe to do. Be strong and courageous. Number six. Number seven, we'll just repeat it. I am with you. Don't forget that. I am with you. Number eight, do not be afraid. There's a lot of fear in our world right now. And it's bringing a divide through this thing called social differencing is what I'm calling it. Where we see the differences in people and we start separating into camps and making inner judgments. And a lot of it's just because of fear. Fear has crept in. People are not, I'm not going to go there. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Number nine, obedience leads to blessing. Obedience leads to blessing. As the worship team comes up, let's look at verse nine, just in reference one more time. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He is with us wherever. You know, you can go places you shouldn't be, and he'll still speak to you in a still small voice. Like, it's not a good idea. The prodigal son never stopped being the child of the father, ever. He, he, he practiced it stupid, really good. I mean, he did good and dumb. But guess what he did? He went back to the father, and the father gladly received him. And the father continued to, to teach him. So will you stand with me? We'll close. I want to close out of a psalm. In uh, Psalm 139, 
ties together with what we're looking at. I hope it has great application in your life. I'm going to read through it and write into prayer, and then we'll, we'll close with a song of worship together. God, thank you for your presence. As we consider this psalm, Psalm 139, it speaks so much about the relationship we have with you and your faithfulness, your kindness, and your patience. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them, if I should count them. They would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, that's our request. We don't want to study ourselves to figure out what to do. We want to learn how to walk with you that you would be free to reign in our hearts, revealing those things that stumble us or hinder us, and that we would hand them over to you, that you would lead us in the way everlasting, the baggage and the weight and the things that so easily ensnare us. Could you take those away, God, that we would see your faithfulness as we affix our eyes upon you, Jesus, the author and the completer, the finisher of our faith. We sing to you with joy and gladness. In your name, Jesus. Amen.